Hello, it's Scott Manley here. When I was a science-obsessed child growing up, I learned all about plutonium, that is, the spicy rocks at the heart of atomic weapons. But moreover, I learned that plutonium was an artificial element which had been synthesised by humans in the laboratory. It didn't exist in nature and was entirely artificial. And of course, as I grew up and learned more about uh, physics, I learned that this was wrong because plutonium does in fact exist in nature. But the stuff we see in nature is generally not primordial. It didn't form with the Earth. If you have any amount of uranium sitting around, then you will have spontaneous fissions happening in those uranium atoms. And some of those fissions will produce neutrons. Some of those neutrons can hit a uranium-238 and transform it into a plutonium-239. So plutonium does exist naturally in the Earth. But because plutonium-239 has a half-life of thousands of years, none of that stuff that was there when the Earth was formed is still in the Earth right now. But there is um, uh, an isotope of plutonium called plutonium-244, which might exist in the Earth entirely naturally. It has a half-life of 81 million years. And that's actually, you know, pretty long for an actinite. It's the fourth longest half-life of any actinites. There's thorium-232, uranium-235, and uranium-238. Now, you know, 100 million years or 80 million years or whatever sounds like a pretty long time. But the Earth is very old and by now, any plutonium-244 that was in the crust has gone through like 60 half-lives. Uh, one estimate of how much is in there on the Earth would be something like 7 grams through the entire planet. So very hard to find any trace of it. And the thing is you can't really form plutonium-244 by accident, by the same process of having, you know, spicy rocks sitting around in, in, the, in the crust of the Earth. Because to make plutonium-244, you have to keep bombarding it with neutrons. And as you go up towards plutonium-244, the isotopes get less stable. And so you need to hit them very, very quickly. And that just doesn't happen in natural forms. Um, it is possible to make it in a high neutron flux nuclear reactor where you design it so it generates lots of neutrons very quickly and you get that plutonium up to 244 where it's stable again. Or it's made in nuclear weapons and you'll find that in nuclear fallout. But there haven't been many, uh, as any evidence that it has been found in terrestrial geology in places untouched by these kind of processes until now. So there's a group uh, led by a guy called Dr. Anton Wallner, uh, and they've been looking at deep ocean sediments. They're like looking at the bottom of the Pacific and one and a half kilometers before that, below that, they've taken out cores and they've looked for extraterrestrial dust, dust that has fallen from space. And of course, the great thing about sediments is they're laid down over time. So not only if they find these interstellar sediments, or materials, they can also correlate it with time. And guess what? They found evidence for plutonium-244 down in these cores. And of course, the reason this is here is because this plutonium can form in space. Uh, in space, there's all sorts of processes that don't happen on Earth. You know, things like cosmic rays, supernova, possibly even more exotic processes which can really throw those neutrons around. So yeah, Turns out these same processes are important in making other radio radioactive isotopes. And previously, the team had been looking at iron-60. So iron-60 is a slightly heavier version of iron. Uh, iron-56 is the normal version. And uh, it has a half-life of, of about 2.6 million years. And that's actually way shorter than plutonium-244. But yeah, back in 2015, they put a lot of effort into actually measuring the half-life of of uh, iron 60 because this is so critical as a marker for various extraterrestrial processes at the time back in 2015 the the half-life of iron 60 was thought to be between one and a half million years and 2.6 or sorry million years right so it's a huge error bar that they had to fix uh, just by you know working on it so with that Iron 60 data, they were then looking at their sediments and they found a couple of periods in uh, geological history where they could see elevated levels of Iron 60 getting deposited from interstellar grains. So there's one period about 8 million years ago 
where it looks like there might have been an event. And then it was a longer period, about one and a half million years between 3.2 and 1.7 million years ago, where they had a sort of continuous elevated level. And one theory that was bandied around at the time and had some evidence to support it was the sun was near a star cluster. And in star clusters, all the stars form at the same time. So if you get a bunch of massive stars, they all reach their retirement age, their very violent retirement age, where they go supernova at around the same time. So you could have a period of supernova in this cluster throwing material sort of continuously at the Earth for about one and a half million years. Anyway, back to plutonium-244. Finding this is much rarer material. It required all sorts of new techniques for processing the cores and trying to tease out that tiny signature, but they eventually found it. Uh, I mean, it was a very tiny one. I, I thought saw one interview with Walner where he talked about finding the six to 10 atoms of extraterrestrial material in a sample, and I'm just sort of mind blown that they're able to find such a small amount of material in a sample. But yeah, they still have enough measurements of plutonium-244 in these cores that they can find correlations in time. And it turns out that it's produced at roughly the same time as the Iron-60. So that strongly suggests that the Iron-60 and the 244 are coming from a similar source. And if that source is a supernova, that would mean that supernovas can produce heavy actinide elements. And there's a whole you know, field of research, wide open field, looking at the origin of the elements that make up the universe. The very young universe when it forms has almost all hydrogen and helium and maybe tiny amounts of lithium that were produced in a very early hot universe. But after that, it's very boring until stars form and the stars in their cores, they start fusing the hydrogen and the helium and they start making heavier and heavier elements. And you get things like carbon, oxygen, silicon, and eventually they get up to iron. And at that point, they have to stop because there's no more energy available from fusion. And those stars that make iron, their core collapses down. And as it collapses, that releases a lot of gravitational energy and it blows off the out exterior. And it's thought that this, while this is a collapse, it's also an energy release which blows off material which has been transformed at the core of the star. And it's not been clear whether the conditions inside a supernova could make something as neutron rich and heavy as plutonium. And this is now some evidence that maybe a core collapse supernova can in fact do that. But the thing is, like to make anything big and heavy, it's not a slow process, right? There's so many, when you're trying to take a, an atom and make a heavier isotope and you're bombarding with various particles, the problem is you will inevitably run into, you will hit it with a, a neutron and you'll make it heavier and then the heavier version is so unstable it decays in, with an alpha particle and you've been set back. So there's a, a whole bunch of elements you can easily produce unless you have atoms getting exposed to massive fluxes of neutrons. And it's thought that the plutoniums and you know the actinide elements are way up in that region. So another thing they did was they looked at the ratio of the iron 60 in these samples to the plutonium. And they think that the ratio is wrong. There's too little plutonium. Now, you can get estimates of what it should be in nature just by looking at things like meteorites and looking at the ratios of the decay products because of course although the plutonium is decayed they're still trapped inside these meteorites uh, or that have been sitting in space uh, unmodified since the formation of the solar system so you can estimate what might have been there in the past right what have radioactive elements were there so if the plutonium is lower than is expected from versus this background then maybe that indicates that supernova aren't actually the main generators of these heavy actinide elements. And that would actually make sense because we were never sure there was enough neutron flux there. And there is an alternate method for making these really heavy elements in large quantities, and that is neutron star mergers, where leftover neutron star cores, they spiral into each other, and as they spiral in, they release a lot of energy, and this energy drives these neutrons off at relativistic speeds, they smash into each other, they form a glorious cascade of new elements 
unconstrained by you know weak processes, relatively garden variety processes like supernova. The neutron star mergers are incredibly violent events and we did find evidence for this. The very first gravitational wave event which had an optical counterpart is thought to be a neutron star merger and these are very likely critical in seeding the universe with these really heavy elements. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.